And Clint, would you lead us in prayer, please? Holy, wise, righteous Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for this time that we have to study from your word. Pray that you would be with our congregation, be with those who are not able to be here today. Pray that you would lend a helping hand to them. Pray that you would help us as we study from your word, as we can increase in faith and knowledge and wisdom, that we can apply the things that we need to to our lives and we can be better servants for you. We pray for those who are sick of our congregation. Pray that you would help them, encourage them, that they can be with us again. Pray for the leaders of this world, that they would let us live in peace. Pray that you would help us to have open doors that we can preach and teach your word to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, Ephesians 4. Let's read verses 17 to 24 to begin with. Who will get that? Ephesians 4, 17 to 24. <clears throat> John. This is 17 to 24? Yes, sir. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity, that is not the way you learned, but that is not the way you learn Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Okay. So remember the first part of the chapter talking and emphasizing on unity and then the idea of growth and different gifts given for the purpose of growth, growth of the body of Christ. And here is talking about the fact that if we're going to, going to have unity and growth, then we have to be like our Savior. We need to put on the new man who's renewed according to the spirit of the mind. And question number six, I had asked, describe the condition of one who walks like the rest of the Gentiles in verses 17 to 19 there. So what's that life like of one who lives like the world? Okay, you're alienated from God, from the life of God, being separated from Him. Well, when you're in the garden... You're in an absolute dark. You cannot see anything. Mm -hmm. You cannot see what's around you, what's coming near you, what's going to happen to you. But with God, with the light, you know what's good and bad. Right. The, the darkness, the blindness being described here, uh, what's it like being in the absolute dark? You don't know where you are, what direction to go, or what that next step is. How how does that feel? I spent three days in, in a box. No light. They took you out, had a hood over you. And uh, you lose track of everything around you. You, you start getting disoriented. Uh, light plays a major effect on the body that you don't realize. It, your, your biological clock, for example, so it, you know, just you don't know what's going on around you. Right, right. The, um, up in Kentucky, they have mammoth caves, like the largest cave system in the world. And they'll tell you about, if you take the tour, that back, you know, in the past centuries that people have gotten lost in that cave or other caves. And if they get down in there and they get into true darkness, they can get disoriented, they get lost, and they go crazy being down in there. Um, and it's fearful, it's frightful to be in a condition where you don't know what's around you and your mind can start playing tricks on you. So here he's talking about spiritually speaking, these people are in darkness. They don't know what's around them. There, there are fears that they have 
their anxieties, their troubles, their things that bother them that would be resolved if they came to the light, if they turned to God and they understood things clearly um, about life, about troubles, difficulties, um, about where they go after they die. You know, there's so many people in this world who are absolutely petrified of death because they don't understand what's on the other side. They're not prepared for that. Whereas a child of God, we should have no fear of death whatsoever, recognizing, you know, when I die, I'm, I'm going to be better off. So we have that light to tell us. It's not that we avoid it, but we know what's ahead. Mike? Well, just in our relationships with other people and stuff like that, people who are darkness have to kind of stumble through that. <laughs> Whereas we're told how to you know, deal with your fellow man, deal with your family. This is how you bring happiness and joy and peace in your life. And, um, you know, just, just navigating life in general is hard enough. And to, without the instruction that we have, just the books of wisdom that we have, Proverbs and, um, and Ecclesiastes, and then what we read in the New Testament as well through the Gospels, and, and then in, in the letters to the Christians, I, it's just amazing to me how people make it through life with, without knowing what we know. Right. That just plays into, and it just came to mind as to what it really means here because of the ignorance that is in them. It's when you're in darkness, there's a lack of sense. So you have no knowledge of what's going on. So there's an ignorance there. And that would be one way to look at that. And the ignorance that is in them, they were completely dark. So they had no knowledge. Right. You look at their societies and the, the way that those societies operated in the corruption. I thought you had a good point. The, if the scriptures and the gospel is not there to guide you, it's a scary thing. And you can look at Hollywood and the movies that men come up with. That's the futility of men's mind. And that's what man's given over to. Just think how creative we are and all the, the horrible things that go on in, in that we see in movies, that is created by the minds of man. And that's what man gives themselves over to whenever they don't have the scriptures to, to guide their lives. It's a scary, it's a scary thing. There are terrible things that we come up with. We create our own gods, we create our own rules, we create, you know, our own, you know, relationships, uh, rules for uh, relationships even, you know, like we have now with this transgender and homosexuality and all this crazy, just uh, insane. Way of, way of living, but that's that's what man's mind comes up with. That's the utility of men's mind right there. Yes, and just briefly, and then I want to move on, um, you come up with people who believe a certain rock, a crystal, if they wear it, they have certain powers or insight into the world. It's just it's bonkers, right? That's, that's what that ignorance uh, does. So it's futile uh, to live like that. Well, as we go on then, and question number seven, I'd ask, how do we change our old ways, verses 20 to 24? And this all goes together, but how, how do we change? What does he say to do? When you get into the truth of Jesus, you don't walk in the futility of your mind. Instead, you've learned of Christ, which is the gospel, which is the truth, which is your way of living, your work. Yes. Renewed in the spirit of your mind, Ron. Yes, as he, he's telling us here as we read that, you know, he mentions that you have not so learned Christ. So it's the process that Paul wrote about, the transformation that takes place. Putting off the old, putting on the new. And he's telling us that we are renewed in our minds, putting on the new self and the likeness of God created in righteousness, holiness, and truth. Mm -hmm. And you do that by renewing the mind. How do you renew that mind? Study. Study. Christianity is inherently based in logic and reason. It's a thinking religion. The world tries to get us to believe that Christianity is just a feeling. And unfortunately, religious groups have bought into that idea that it's just how you feel about something. And atheists try to say, you know, we, we lean on a crutch of faith. We just believe in 
just to believe like it's a, a myth, a fantasy, a fairy tale. But Christianity absolutely appeals to man's logic and reasoning abilities, his understanding. That's how you renew yourself. You have to retrain your mind, your way of thinking, your outlook on the world. And when you understand that truth, you just make that firm decision, that's what I'm going to do. That's how I'm going to live. And then your behavior, your life, your attitudes change. Any other thoughts there? Mike. Well, there has to be an understanding also of laying aside that or comparing that old self with the new self. And, you know, this is how I used to be. This is how I am now. I don't want to go back to that. Right. Right. No looking back. Ron. In that, as you were saying, Stephen, we, we are created by God, and God knows what is best for us. The Word of God has an affinity to us like nothing else in our life. Right. Yes, exactly right. Any other thoughts there? All right, let's tweet, read 25 to 32, please. 25 to 32. Chris. Therefore, put it away, lying. Let each one of you speak truth with his name. For we are members of one another. Be angry, do not sin. Do not let your son go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole still no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may some that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impact grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So he goes through this long list of things we are to put off, gets specific about put these things away and incorporate these things into your life. <clears throat> I'm going to skip over question eight, but just hit some of these real quick. You know, he, he talks about putting away the lying. And in opposition to that, speak truth with his neighbor. And first and foremost, he would have that to be the truth speaking to your neighbor as a child of God, your, your brothers and sisters in Christ. But it would truly be with everyone. For we are members of one another. So we, in the body of Christ, you know, if your physical body, like if your brain is lying to your foot, your foot does something funny. And you go to the doctor and find out what's wrong. There's something wrong here. There's something not being communicated right. If you, if you can't move your hand because there's something short-circuited, that's lying, if you will. So in the body, we have to have truth. We have to have that truth being communicated. And that's how we're going to function well. So he goes through these things, tells us things not to do and things to do. And if we will apply these separating ourselves from the world, then we are going to please God. Because in verse 30, he says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. We can grieve God. We do grieve God when we live in sin, when we participate in these things that he says, you need to get rid of them. And we don't want to grieve God. We want to please him and to honor him. Any other thoughts there? Chapter 4. Mike. Just a very quick thought whenever he says he who steals will steal no longer, but instead, as you pointed out, you got to replace that with something. You can't just stop stealing. That's not really repentance. Mm -hmm. You have to stop stealing and replace it with something else that's wholesome. And or else you have this void. And if you have that void, eventually the sin will come back in. Something's got to take that void over. So either replace it with uh, righteousness, if you don't, then it's going to, unrighteousness is going to come back and it's going to be even worse than what it was before. Right, right. Alluding to the Lord's teaching on that, coming back with more evil spirits. 
exactly right, Nancy. Uh, and everything that we're talking about here and doing as Christ says and doing as the world does, verse 20 has a word in there. You have not so learned. All of this is a function of learning. You mm -hmm. learn negative or you learn positive. Mm -hmm. So it can all be unlearned or relearned according to what you need. So that's a very hopeful verse right there. Learn. Exactly. You can change. Yeah. You absolutely can change. Very good. All right. I hate to rush, but uh, let's jump into chapter 5. Let's read verses 1 through 7, please. 1 through 7. Who will grab that? Clint. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us in offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving the thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them. Okay. So a Christian is to walk in love. And what's that first admonition he gives on that? Verse 1. Who are we to... As Christ. Okay, Im imitate and walk in love as Christ also has loved us. We, we imitate God. It literally is the idea of mimic God. To mimic after Him. And he's gone through chapter 4, some of those things, and changing and being Christ-like. And he goes on down through here and tells us other things we are to eliminate. But when it says walk in love, what does that imply? Live. Did live? Live. Live. Function. Function. It could be put in any kind of way that relates to the actions that you take in your everyday life. Actions. Love is an action. So we have to walk. We have to be active in doing this and love as Christ did. Um, how did Christ love us? And he gave his life for us. Yeah. While we were alienated from him, while we were not uh, justified in receiving that love because of our sin. In rebellion. Toward him. Yes. Yeah. And he he was thinking about us. What's good for us was what was on his mind when he came to this earth and gave himself as a sacrifice. And it says that that sacrifice was a sweet smelling aroma to God. It pleased God that he offered himself as a sacrifice. And so the implication is. When we walk in love as Christ did, we're going to be pleasing to God. We're going to be self-sacrificing. And He will accept that and, and accept us as a sacrifice before Him. So He goes through all these things that He says to abstain from. What's the general category of these specifics that He mentions? When He says... Fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, filthiness, foolish talking, coarse jesting. Do those fit in a particular category? I mean, before we had lying, we had stealing, we had anger, wrath. It's all worldly, worldly behavior. It's all worldly behavior. Lust of the flesh. Lust of the flesh. Or could be lust of the eyes. It's, it deals with that broad category of sexual sins, sensual sins that he's really talking about here. And we need to understand, you know, we live in a day and age where it is a rampant problem. It, it's, it's worse than the plague that we have on the land now. The sexual immorality that is rampant in our land is terrible. We need to understand that ancient Gentile world was just as or worse. It was just as bad or worse back then 
than it is now. And that's why you see it keep coming up throughout the New Testament. It was a very major problem that Christians had to wrestle with and deal with and get away from, Mike. Specifically where they are, I mean, we're talking to the Ephesians, so they would have been in Ephesus, which would have been like San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, you have the Temple of Diana there, all types of idolatry taking place. Um, he says specifically here, you know, he, he lists these out, like fornication. What would fornication be? Sex outside of marriage. Sex outside of marriage. Illicit sexual intercourse is the basic uh, premise of that. And that, that can encompass many different things. Uh, from homosexuality to adultery to premarital sex, all those kinds of things. Uh, uncleanness, what is that? That would include behavior that leads to fornication. So touching, looking, flirting, dancing type things where you have the young people getting out there and sometimes older people, you know, they, they get involved in that. Covetousness. What is the base meaning of covetousness? You want what someone else has. Yeah, want what someone else has. What's the application in this passage? Okay, just like Moses revealed in the law, you know, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Mike, you have something? So, yeah, that's coveting someone that is not yours. That's what that's talking about. Okay, so he says of these sins, verse 3, how should we look at them? How should we feel about them? Latter part of 3. They're not fitting. Shouldn't even be what? Shouldn't exist. When it says not even be named, he's not saying don't list these sins. He just did that. He's saying don't let that be found among you. That, that's not fitting for a child of God. It's not appropriate for a child of God. So then he goes on to talk about filthiness. It's, that's just generally obscene things. It could be dress, it could be speech, things like that. It could be deeds that are done. But then he gets specific on some of the speech. Foolish talking is irreverent speech. It could be mocking moral teaching. Coarse jesting, what's that? Crude jokes, Crude jokes innuendo, those kinds of things. Uh, speech should be one of what? Verse 4. Giving of, thanks or showing. giving of thanks instead of being crude having that innuendo telling those dirty jokes it should be one of giving of thanks in other words you should be spiritually minded not carnally minded and that will come out in the way that you speak and talk to others so verses 5 through 7 those who are worldly don't walk in love and of course they're going to end up losing their souls um Question number one I asked, how are we deceived and who does it? Verse 6. How are we deceived? By persuasive words. What might some of those be? Well, some of it in, in, in regard to, the, um, to your faith would be encouraging you to um, worship or uh, feel differently. In other words, an emotional response rather than a logical, intellectual response to something. This will this will make you feel so good and, mm -hmm. and this will make you feel happy. It's that kind of... Uh, um, it's asking you to feel better about something than you really maybe are currently encouraging you in that direction to feel differently. Yeah, just make one point then Ron. You, you ever talk to someone about the gospel, about the one true church, about God's plan of salvation, and they ask you, are you telling me my grandma's in hell? No. Um, okay. 
So they, they try to persuade you through that emotional argument, well, it negates the truth. No, it doesn't negate the truth. Ron? You know, the pattern that we see, it goes all the way back to the beginning, mm -hmm. that it looks appealing. There isn't anything wrong with it. God didn't say, don't do it. Certainly, you know, this is a good thing. Right. And those all lead us unto the deception. Mm -hmm. Going back to John's mention a while ago about Hollywood, what does Hollywood say about fornication? Pleasurable. It's great. Why not? I mean, there's entire movies built around the celebration of fornication, right? Um, nothing wrong with looking, right? Is that what we hear from the world? Oh, you can look, just don't touch. What does the Bible say? A woman who looks after, or a man who looks after a woman to lust for her in his heart, has done what? Already committed adultery, right? So, yeah, there's, it's wrong to look. Not just wrong to do, it's wrong to look and to lust. Well, a dirty joke's just good fun. And, you know, sometimes among Christians, and I'm sad to say sometimes among preachers, it's kind of funny, they think. Tell something a little off color. You can divorce and remarry for any reason. Well, that's a big one from the world, isn't it? Just doesn't matter. You're not happy. You know, things aren't going well. That's okay. Just get rid of that. Go find someone else. Life will be good. So there's all kinds of things. And then, as John mentioned a while ago, the whole transgender issue today is it's just completely crazy. But it's the world telling us through deceitful words, oh, um, what, what's the phrase they say with love now? Um, I can't think of it. It just, just slipped my mind. But basically they're saying love who you want. Maybe that's the phrase. Love who you want. Oh, that, that sounds innocent, right? But it's not. It's very deadly. Well, I, I think what I've heard is love is love. Okay. Love is love. Love is love. Right. No boundaries, no distinctions. Love is love. Love is love. Exactly. Um, I, okay, so it gets all the way down into restaurant marketing, advertising. I don't know if they still do it or not, but no rules, just right. You know, I heard that years ago. I was like, really? But that's the way that people look at the world around us. That there's really no rules. So there's deceitful words, and Satan is the one behind it to deceive us, to get us involved in sin. And we have to be careful that Satan can be using friends and co-workers and family members that slowly work on our mind about changing, you know. I once thought homosexuality was wrong and it was a sin, but now somebody in my family is a homosexual, so I'm waffling on this. You, know, you cannot do that. That's deceitful words. And if we're deceived by that, we'll end up losing our souls. Um, God's not going to overlook these common sins, but the wrath of God will come upon anyone who participates in in them. So he says, don't be partakers with them. Walking in love means casting off the things that are against God's will. Any thoughts before we press on, well, Mike? I was going to say, because we're talking about love, and then you just mentioned how the world views love, there's some blurry lines that we try to draw in there. Mm -hmm. And But God's way of love is far different than the world's way of love. And that's why it's important that we do study this and understand what God's definition of love is and his definition of what true peace, true joy, what true unity looks like. Because there's all kinds of definitions being introduced into the church now um, also, not just in the, in the world, but in the church as well. Right, right, exactly. John and then Nancy. Well, I was thinking, if you go back to where you started with Grandma, you know, in the, in the church we have to be careful about people who are good people, who we hold in high esteem who don't do anything wrong in, in the minds of the world, if they're not teaching the truth, if they're not living by the right standard or, or holding the right standard, that's also who this verse is talking about, just like they are the transgender homosexual Hollywood crowd. Those 
who are good, no matter how good they are, if they're not teaching and preaching and living the truth, then they are the people that are being talked about here. And we are not to associate with those people, no, how, no matter how good they are, if they're not teaching the truth. Right. Nancy. Uh, I was thinking about in uh, 1 Timothy, in the 5th chapter, where Paul warns Timothy not to be a taker in other men's sins. And I think that's what we're talking about here, where you may mentally assent, well, maybe they're right about that. Maybe you're not even vocal about it, but you have just begun to participate in their sin. And we know that the heart is, is where all of the issues of life are. So if we start listening to and accepting that, even if we don't argue it, we have become a partaker in other men's sins. We may never commit that sin ourselves. Yeah. Romans chapter 1, Paul deals very specifically with that. Not only do them, but approve mm -hmm. them. Well, what it shows is that all they are are people pleasers instead of God pleasers. You want to please the people because you've got to fill each seat inside that building. Well, either you do that or you please God. It's, it's, it's not a two-way street. It's one way. Mm -hmm. You can't please the people. If God's Word is what it is. It's exactly. Exactly. Very good. All right, let's read verses 8 through 14, please. Who will grab that? Ephesians 5, 8 to 14. For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the light of the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light. For everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ is found in you. Okay. So, he says, When we were in the world, we were darkness like the world around us, of course, but now we're light in the Lord. Walk us children of light. We need to shine forth that light. The, the light that we have is only reflective. It's like the sun and the moon, right? You have Christ, who's the true light, and we reflect His light into the world around us or through us, may be a better way to look at that. We, we show that light. We are a conduit for that light into the world around us uh, to set an example for the people that they may come to the light, that they may see what it is to be a child of God. Now, he says in verses 9 and 10 that, you know, the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. The fruit of the Spirit is this light coming out in our lives. We have genuine moral excellence. We're doing what is right. We live by that truth that is a reliable fact revealed in the Word of God. Uh, question number two I had asked, how are we to react to unfruitful works of darkness? Verse 11. Expose. Okay, expose. Anything else? We have no fellowship with it, so there's, there's no support. There's no condoning. There's no partaking just by doing verse 7 again. Don't even speak it. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's shameful to even speak of those things which are done by them in secret. You know, there, it sins, um, you get into, like if you ever find out details about sins, they're horrific. And again, as John mentioned a while ago, you know, the Hollywood movies, they, they relish in the details of, of sin and wickedness and unrighteousness. And sadly, it's being promoted so much into even what they call children's TV right. shows and movies now. Mm -hmm. It's sneaking in a little bit at a time. And mm -hmm. it, it's amazing what they throw in there. And it, it, if you don't pay attention, you won't catch it. But sometimes you'll see these little things and those are going in those little minds and it's like, oh, man. Exactly right. He says for us to not have fellowship with those unfruitful works of darkness, but rather to expose them. Does anybody have an alternate translation besides expose? 
Reprove. Rebuke. Rebuke. Yeah, and it carries with it that idea. Uh, the expositor of the Greek Testament says this carries with it the idea of corrective reproving. So again, it goes back to what Nancy mentioned a while ago. It's, it's not just not participating, but it is our duty and responsibility to expose those things as wicked and rebuke them. I mean, how do you get someone to become a child of God? It's not by avoiding the sin in their life. You have to address that sin. This is sin. You, you have... If they're not convicted of sin, they are not going to see a need to change. Acts chapter 2 is a great pattern and a case study for that. He just pointed out very plainly, those, those people were moral people. They weren't adulterers or liars or cheaters or anything like that in general. Those were the religious Jews who were zealous to be there on the day of Pentecost. But he says, here's your sin. You killed the Son of God. And he convicted them of that. Then they saw, we need to change. What? Yeah, you have to go on the offense. I mean, you know, and, and you have to go after it. There's a reason you have a sword. It's not just for defending. It is for actual going out and making it an attack on something. Right, exactly right. Prick them in their hearts. Um, I would say the majority of us can think back to when we heard the gospel and there was some point where we were pricked in our hearts, where we realized, I've got to make a change. Um, so... He's saying do that, follow after that. And then he follows on with that, that we, as we're out there teaching, it's, it's, or as we are trying to expose those things, it's shameful to even speak of those things, but the light makes these things manifest. It brings them out. Um, as we've studied in John 3, you know, that light reveals these things. So we have to be knowledgeable of the truth to be able to confront the darkness that is around us. All right, anything through 14? Well, just what he says here, um, a white sleeper uh, rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. That only happens whenever a Christian exposes what we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. That's our job, to bring the light so that this person can arise from the dead. Right, exactly. We want them to share and participate and the blessings of Christ. All right, let's read verses 15 to 21, please. Who will grab that for us? 15 to 21. Wendell, do you want to get it? Yeah. Go ahead. See them that ye walk circumspectively, not as fools, but as wise. Redeem the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine word in excess, but be filled with spirit. Speaking to, to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the same name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit yourself one to another in the fear of God. Okay. So walk in love, walk in light, of course, walk in wisdom. Here, our lives have to be lived according to wisdom. And he says, see that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. What's that idea of circumspectly? Walk. Walk. Walk here. Walk. walk. Walk with wisdom. <coughs> Anything else? This is the same word as in Acts 18.25 where it says they taught Apollos the way of the Lord more accurately. And what it's saying here is we have a strict standard by which we are to live. We're, we're to be knowledgeable of that, have a correct understanding and follow after that. So we need to understand our place in life. We need to understand sin, the nature of sin. We need to understand God's will and how to live by God's will. Question number three I had asked, how do we redeem the time? Verse 16. I've been wise and listening to what 
the scriptures teach us in making corrections in our life. Okay, making corrections in our life. Anything else? This gives us the idea of uh, buying up what is available to us or buying an opportunity. So what we need to do is recognize those opportunities to do as he's previously been telling us and to exercise ourselves on all of those things. And, and so doing, we're redeeming the time. Right, redeeming, like you redeem a coupon, you, you extract the value out of that coupon, redeeming the time, what time you have, you extract the value out of it. Rick? No. So, we take advantage of those opportunities, as Ron was saying, that are put before us. Take advantage of that opportunity. Um, you've got that few minutes, you're, you're waiting on an appointment, waiting to go in, or you're, you're sitting in the waiting room or something to go in. You might pray. You might bring up your Bible app and, and read some scripture, re redeem that time. Um, you might invite that person to services, the person that you thought, you know, I, I should invite them. And you think that for six months or six years. You know, redeem the time. Go ahead and do it. The next time that opportunity presents itself or create that opportunity even, and invite that person <coughs> to services, to come and to sit down and to study the Bible. Um, correct a false statement that is made. So expose, rebuke, reprove. Do, do that as those opportunities are, arise and redeem that time because you know the older we get the more we realize that time that we had years ago, yesterday, it's gone and we are never ever going to get it back. And there are some opportunities we've had, that was it. I will never have that opportunity again. And sometimes we hold regrets over those things. So he says, redeem the time because the days are evil. We need to be working. Satan is working. We need to be working. Uh, any other thoughts thus far down to that point? Just a quick side thought on that point of redeeming the time. We pray often for God to open the doors for us to do things. According to his will. If we pray and ask him to open doors, we need to take advantage, redeem the time that we have that he gives us. Yeah, sometimes we pray and the answer is right there in front of us. <laughs> and, we, and we overlook it. Sometimes. We overlook it. Ex exactly right. Now, very interesting thing that he talks about here. Do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Uh, he's saying don't be under the influence of intoxicants. Be under the influence of the Spirit. So, it's like this. Uh, what do intoxicants do for people? Lower their inhibitions. They numb. They numb them to what? Uh, okay, stupidity sometimes. It's a temporary high. Yeah. Okay. It, it's something where whatever pain they may be having, they can numb themselves to that, or they're looking for that little bit of excitement, that edge in life. John, do you have something? Well, he's saying here that if you do that, you're going to be right. You're, you're going to riot, which is that way that the, what the prodigal son did in, in wayward living. That, that's directly tied to, the, to that drunkenness. If, if, you, if you do that, you're going to have prodigal living. You're going to have work of participate in, in riots or evil evil doing. But that's the, the thought I think that he's putting forth here is that, that you're going to be sinful if you're, if you're a drinker. Yeah, you're, you're going to be involved in things that are a waste. Instead of redeeming the time, you're wasting the time. Yeah, that dissipation is a decline. It yeah. is, like as we know, um, you know, when people become drunk, everything declines with them. Mm -hmm. And if we look at dissipation in terms of the effect on wealth, it's a diluting or dispensing of all of it. And that's what they've done to their lives. Exactly. It, it will eat away and erode away at those things. People use intoxicants, whether it's alcohol, drugs, illegal, legal drugs, I mean, all kinds of things. They use it to avoid problems in life. It clouds judgment. You know, even, you know, some people want to try to make this argument, well, one or two beers or one or two 
you know, shots of whiskey aren't a big deal. Yeah, it's a big deal. It immediately, it's, it immediately starts poisoning your system. And that's the whole thing that gets that ball rolling. And so it clouds judgment. It breaks down morals, as was mentioned a moment ago. You know, you, the inhibitions that you have, those can very easily drop when you begin to partake of the intoxicants. And it erodes determination. So he's saying don't, don't, don't deal with life, its difficulties, its challenges. Don't seek the thrills, the excitement in these intoxicating things. Seek it through the Spirit, who's the revelator of truth. That's where you deal with your problems in life. That's how you cope with it. And that's where you find true excitement in life. And what motivates you day by day, what gets you excited about each day in life. So, you live by the Spirit, the things of God, not by the world, the things of the world. Um, any thoughts on that point? Verse 19 then, what does he say, being filled with the Spirit? What's one of the ways we do that? How... Can we aid one another in being filled with the Spirit? Through our singing. Through our singing. Through musical worship. Okay. Here, here's one of the things, just because we're not going to get to the end of the chapter. Here's one of the things. We, I think, sometimes allow the denominational world around us to co opt certain terms. You don't believe in music and worship? I absolutely believe in music and worship. Yeah, I believe in music and worship. 100%. I believe in exactly what the New Testament teaches right here. Speaking to one another, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. That, that's how we help each other be filled with the Spirit. We're, as Colossians says, we're teaching, we're admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We're, we're building each other up. And thus we're filled with the Spirit. Um, I, I, don't, I don't want to go too far with this. Have, okay, we, we have singing in our worship. And it is encouraging to come together and sing hymns with one another. Have, have any of you ever been in a large crowd of Christians for a singing. I'm talking about like 500, 700. What, what is that experience like? Exactly. And, and while I understand when we, when we study the Word of God, we, we learn the Word of God, we can have emotional reactions to that. But the, the singing, especially you, you have a large group like that, it adds a different dynamic. You hear all those voices. That is emotionally moving. One of the thoughts that crosses your mind in those situations is heaven. Because exactly. you're going to be there with all the saints singing. So right. imagine what that's going to be like. Okay. What, what are you going to do for all eternity? Praise God. Well, if you've ever been in something like that, and that's just a foretaste of the glory that's to come, that, that's exciting. That's motivating. So, yes, we, we do this. We sing. We teach in our singing one another. Encourage. Motivate one another. And in this, he talks about verses 20 and 21, giving thanks for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God, remembering we've got that relationship to God and we have a relationship to one another. And we can help each other. We can walk in love. We can walk in light. We can walk in wisdom and be a great benefit to each other as we seek to serve God. And, of course, he's going to go on and name specifics, especially you know, family relationships, employment or business relationships as he goes on down. Lord willing, we'll get to that in the future. But we're out of time. Anybody else have anything that they really need to make a comment on before we close? All right, thank you all. Lord willing, light a part of Ephesians 5. We'll get into 6, hopefully next week.